it's probably one of the lines of um, what the hell is a Zen Roshi? Because that's what I am. <coughs> and for that matter, what am I doing married to a Christian theologian? You might have changed me and stuff. Um, <coughs> I have devoted half my life to this and to practicing and serving the religious practice that is completely, in a sense, um, from the world's point of view, the world around me point of view is utterly mysterious. I mean, to say Zen Roshi, no one's face lights up. No one knows what that possibly might mean. <coughs> Which is itself an interesting predicament at times. When people say, well, what do you do? <laughs> it's um, you know, those interesting moments. The word Roshi actually means old teacher, which doesn't necessarily mean elderly, but, but it does mean, um, in a sense, the furthest you can go in terms of appointment. Um, I'm in the position as a Roshi to appoint other people to teach, and this is a quite carefully guarded process in the Zen tradition. It's not as though anyone can sort of nominate themselves a teacher. Very much you are nominated or you are called to teach by your own teacher. And so it's very much a lineage tradition. Lineage as in from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher, all the way back, if you go back in time, to Shakyamuni Buddha. And the lineage chart you have to prepare when you're going through the big ceremony of transmission includes making by hand your own lineage chart that actually charts all the way through <clears throat> the bloodline, as it's called, in Reading, through something like uh, 400 generations of teachers, teacher to teacher to teacher, and all their names, all the way down to my name. <clears throat> and then, interestingly, the bloodline or the line continues on and it goes all the way down to the top and passes through an empty circle back to the Buddha. So seen as this way that the enlightenment of that character, Shakyamuni Buddha, some uh, six or seven hundred years before the birth of Christ, was <clears throat> had an enlightenment experience that has in a way radiated all the way down to the present moment. It transformed the way, it transformed its local Hindu tradition radically. And <clears throat> it's called a religious tradition because it is addressing the great religious questions. However, it is not the veneration of a deity. <coughs> this doesn't mean that people don't have something very strongly similar to a sense of the inconceivable, we might call it the inconceivable nature of what can be called God in other traditions. It's very much what moves through and lights up the Zen tradition. But it is not called by the name of something resembling a person at all. That's the part that I think is difficult to assimilate easily into a Christian sphere of culture such as Australia. The West in general. But in fact, when you look closely, you'll find there's a lot of, a lot of uh, affinity between aspects of Zen and aspects of Zen Christianity. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll touch on those. So when people say, What do you do? It's always a moment when I shrink because I never know which part of my life to mention. I've had so many different chapters that look so unlike each other. I've been an academic, as, as we just heard. I was an academic for strongly for about two decades. Published books, these are just two of the books I published on the Australian film industry. And they did become classics of their time. The Screening of Australia, Anatomy of a Film Industry, and Anatomy of National Cinema. And I gave, you know, that was sort of like an life for quite some time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm teaching film and media studies. UTS was in fact where I taught uh, film, was actually the pioneer of what has become a very uh, much copied and, and repeated um, form of degree of 
Bachelor of Arts, Media Arts. So with production in radio, film, television, journalism, and so on, as a practical wing to a humanities degree. That's been copied just about at every university in Australia. Um, we pioneered it. <coughs> I also taught, or at least I had a five-year research fellowship at UWS, University of Western Sydney, and I've taught at the film school, the Australian Film School, as well. <coughs> but then there's chapters of my life that include much more focus on writing and directing films, on making of radio documentaries, and of course, author of books that are here. So another question I often get asked, but it's always an interesting one, is so what is, how did you get to be a Zen Buddhist, and, and what even is that? It's very hard, I think, probably hard, probably, to trace the sort of mysterious ways in which your life is shaped in a particular way. It goes back much further than, um, it goes back much further than I can even discover. But I think it's deeply embedded in the natural world. And I'll try to explain how that can be. I do discover when I look back, um, and I had diaries that I kept, extensive diaries, through my early teens and through to my mid-twenties. And I do discover there, if I read, if I can bear to read back through them, that there's a lot of, there's sort of threaded through it, there's sudden discoveries of Zen, like I've read a Zen book of some sort, and it, it is sort of pierced me in some way, and I write about that. I had forgotten about that until I looked back. I do remember also cutting down a lot of Chinese and understand things that Zen Buddhism is thought of as a Japanese tradition. It is, of course, a Chinese tradition um, that has also moved into Japan, into Korea, into Vietnam, into um, <clears throat> certainly into the West by now as well. But it comes through the very word Chan. Chan Buddhism, which is the Chinese way of trying to say the word jhana, which is a Sanskrit word meaning concentration, but it means much more than that. It means uh, highly focused, uh, deeply focused mind, jhana, that state is called jhana. That becomes chan in China, and then the attempt to say chan in Japan renders it as zen. So it's all the same line of, of tradition. And I, so I found myself writing down Chinese poetry that belonged to that period of, especially the Tang and Song dynasties of China, which is a hugely important period for Chan Buddhism. Chan arose strongly and shaped those two great dynastic periods. And that kind of poetry is very, very open to the natural world. It is, it, if you like to put it into a local context, it's like God apparent in every detail of the natural world. Um, but without saying God, without limiting in any way in that form. So I have sort of walked in the footsteps almost of a lot of Chinese and later Japanese poets, and that very pared down, um, very sensitive response to the natural world just was very immediately appealing to me. Probably the very earliest thing, even before that, was my brother and sister and I have got very, very deeply close. So my brother and sister and I would set out on our bicycles. We lived in North Queensland and Cairns when it was still a very tiny place, with fringed entirely by the natural world in technical, <laughs> the rainforest and the cane fields and the creatures and the Great Barrier Reef. We finally decided it could be uh, tossed aside in favour of coal. And um, <clears throat> 
So that early bed for childhood in North Queensland, we ride off on our bicycles. And the first person to remember to say, and please don't ask me where this saying came from because none of us know, the first person to say, I've got Buddha on my handlebars, was considered very lucky. And the other two people were sort of annoyed that they didn't get any votes. So. But I, none of us know where that came from or why. But we also had King John living in our cupboard at the end of the hall. So it's just one of those things. So that it was really the natural world that created what you might call the propensity for the religious tradition that has shaped my life. It's, um, <clears throat> I did have, I, I learned to read very early. And so my imagination woke up, but in fact it woke up in response to the natural world. It's as though my brother and sister and I just sort of radiated up from the house as soon as we woke up and just explored and adventured. And my brother was a kind of natural He He actually was the youngest ever member of the Far North Queensland Naturalist Society and actually contributed to the articles and observations to their newsletter. We had a whole museum under our house of things he had found, birds, nests, uh, many kinds of snakes in bottles. Every now and then one would explode in the middle of the night. <laughs> Another snake had gone off. We also, <coughs> we also had turtles and we had at one time 11 snakes living with us in our house. I loved, I still love snakes, they're very beautiful creatures. And <clears throat> just that sense of being awake in the natural world, it is a religious experience, you know, in itself. It is like a constant sort of conversation, a deep intimate conversation that is somehow saying, you fit here, you, know, you fit, you belong. And I think living in a city, fight your way back to that sense of belonging. You have to shed a whole lot of alienated body and mind that doesn't know that it completely belongs here on the earth. So another thing that came to light in my childhood was a very strong sense that everything is awake as in sentient and awake, alive in that sense. So mountains, very awake creeks and rivers and streams and, and so on, which are somehow clearly and obviously trees. And, but that goes down all the way to little humble weeds. Yeah. A weed is simply a plant, not in the assigned place, but it's still completely alive in a way. So this sense of, um, this was just as compelling to me. I did have sort of religious experiences a while as a child. And every now and then I get intensely um, envious of the Sunday school that we did not attend. We could see it from our bedroom window. And we could see it especially on prize giving evening. Everyone dressed up and got their prizes. <laughs> My sister and I sometimes decided, having had a few religious experiences in that direction, would say to our agnostic parents, oh, we want to go to Sunday school. And my mother finally got our best dresses out, laid them on the bed, and said, okay, put them on and go. So we immediately hid under our beds. We were shocked with the whole idea of breaking out of our world and going into that strange Sunday school. <clears throat> However, um, it wasn't separate from the religious experiences of my childhood were just as fluidly flowing in and out of as everything else. Whatever deep response I had that I gleaned about, about Jesus um, and my childhood encounters with him were just, for me, hard to reconcile with some idea of the Father of God, you know, a sense of, and also with the idea of being guilty from the beginning, not right from the beginning. It just seemed to me not to square what I knew of, not just love in a very of this sense of being completely and entirely at home in the world, a very good fit with the world. 
And so the sense that, that for me has always been very hard to reconcile with the sense of wrongness that seems to be required um, for other faith traditions. David and I have many, many discussions about this. I usually win of course. <laughs> And um, my sister and I also have a very strong sense of not just bondedness, but of the fact that we sort of create the, created the world with our imagination. We had many storied worlds that we lived in, with many characters that we made up and they were there with us, um, when we wanted them to be. And I remember, for example, one time, uh, just as an example of how we, how we collaborated with the natural world in our games, we, um, we had, well, cave toads after every shower of rain, because the lawn and the roads would be covered in the cave toads, even then. But the little tiny toadlets were very cute, the little baby cave toads. So we gathered them up and we had a pool, a little pool created by half the clam shell, a huge one off the barrier reef in our garden, and we forced them to have swimming lessons across the <laughs> across the across the plant. One out of about one in three never made it to the far end. We encouraged them and we told them, you have to learn to swim. This is because we were being forced to learn to swim at the time with a very bad swimming teacher um, <coughs> who tried to drown us at every age. <laughs> but that sense of those little toads also, you know, we'd all rescue them after that. And everything just seemed so damn interesting. And in a way, it's a fundamental kind of um, state of mind that, to me, is strangely missing from what becomes the everyday world, the everyday sense of the world. Like, when you look at it, the fact that this, everything that is here, everything, and this radiates out to the entire universe, that this exists is astonishing. We take it as though, of course it exists, Granted, whereas in fact it is granted. Every moment it's granted, and that's that's an astonishing fact. Then the life exists. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Matter animates itself into not just life, but into conscious life. Life that is conscious of its own life. And <clears throat> life exists, and awareness of this exists. So these for me are they're miracles. They're not ordinary. They're miracles. And to some extent, um, on top of that, gradually as you grow older and move from Cairns to Sydney for complex reasons, um, but I'm very glad about them. And then we were living in Paddington, actually, before it became, um, in, in this, any detail, gentle. Yeah, we lived in Rushcutters Bay at times, just because it's not a way to address the pattern. But um, as you move on to the awareness of the kind of assault that is going on upon this prodigiously beautiful world by a prodigiously self entitled human species. And the fact that it is just laying waste, you know, this marvelous life world, just hit me very hard. I don't know how we bear this. I don't know how we go about bearing it, actually. That world is, or this world is so alive it hurts, you know, and it should hurt. It properly hurts that the aliveness matters. So this sort of came to a bit of a head one. I think I would have been about 12, 11 or 12. My brother and sister and I, my parents, our parents went out that night. And after dinner, we just sat around talking. And the three of us began to kind of explore the, the full weight of this matter. We started to talk about, and there was a time when the limits to growth were being talked about, and 
silence by <coughs> Rachel Carson and the sense of the population explosion being you know, going to be such a profound problem and so on. And this, don't forget that in our lifetimes, you know, the, the population of the world has tripled. You know, this has been an explosive time for human life. And we sat around talking and it just went on. We talked, we talked, we talked, we talked about what hurts so much in a way. We talked about it till about three or four in the morning. And it was the first time I think I'd ever been awake that late. And I took this really strong, I was so hurt, I was so sort of, I felt like I was in pieces. And, <clears throat> and yet at the same time, I think I felt, I remember feeling, it's good to look at this, it's right to look at this. It hurts, but it's right to look at it. And I took that with me to bed as a sort of sense of, I'm taking on the weight of the world in some measure. And then I woke up, and it was a very glary morning because I'd hardly slept, and um, I went back to the same place and on the same kitchen table, bought as all our furniture was from St. Vincent's to Paul, in Paddington. But a beautiful uh, table, which my brother still has then, I don't want to <laughs> And I sat down at the same place I'd sat on that, that evening, and the bowl of cereal I put on the table, I pulled out the same chair, I sat down, on the table, and for some reason, while well, I had this sense of, of shards inside me, of so much is wrong, so much is beyond even imagining how to address the wrong which is so great. For some reason, as I did that, this great wave of well being just rolled through me. And It's very hard to say why that is so deeply appropriate. It's almost as though facing this great matter, loving it and the people you love, and, and sharing it, witnessing it and sharing it together, opened up a sense, you know, the <coughs> many phrases that come to mind <coughs> are like Julian of Norwich, you know, all is well and all manner of things shall be well. That, that really was what I felt. I just felt um, that inside this sort of terror we have to face is a profound medicine of some sort, a profound healing that, is, that we have to seek. And in fact, that, when I was writing uh, and pitching to um, the original publishers, Pan McMillan, this book, Mining the Earth and <clears throat> this is a republication in America. Um, <clears throat> the publisher asked me, you know, why do you want to write this book? And that was exactly the moment that I went back to and I said, I found myself telling her that moment I just told you. And she said at the end of that, she said, good, you've got to write a book. <laughs> and so it was somehow the source of this sense of this whole part of my life that has been very much about, you know, that it is a deep calling us. We're alive now, we're lucky enough to be alive now, and this is such a profound, riddling problem that, um, that we have to rise to the occasion. It has to be, it has to make its call on us. So, <clears throat> my life went on through um, the English and fine arts at honours at university and then they had a film which I studied in Northwestern actually in America, Northwestern University in Chicago. I had my first academic teaching job and so on. Skimmed over that. But then somewhere in my mid-30s I found myself um, stumbling into Zen or walking into Zen actually. I had a remarkable opportunity the old teacher, my grandfather in the village, is Robert Aitken, a great figure in Western Zen world. I'm very proud of my relationship back to him and work, the teaching I received from him. And he was making his last, or a bit like Dame Lily, but he had a few last visits ever to Australia. 
<laughs> this one uh, was scheduled to be the last student he'd make to come and hold Session. Session, I'll talk about Session later, but it basically means a long Zen retreat, a seven day Zen retreat. And just on the eve of that, he made available a whole day in which anybody anywhere could sign up for one hour of his time to come talk to him. And I signed up. I didn't even know why I was like that, but I got my name down. And then I thought, God, what have I done? This is, this is a Zen master. How do I approach a Zen master for a whole hour? What am I going to say? I was at that stage on the very, in the writing stage of a feature film I made called Breathing Underwater, which is my attempt to look at how are we living with the pressure of nuclear extinction. How do we come to live just as though it's an everyday fact? And where, does it, where do the roots of that go down into our lives and culture and our way of thinking about the world? So I was in the, in the process of working towards writing that and writing many drafts of it. So I think I was going to go and talk to him about that. And in fact, I did partly. And I started off by asking him, what do you think of death? <laughs> he said, well, I'm quite elderly, so I think about it. <laughs> really interested in it in um, We started there, and we talked also about the unconscious, because it seems to me that we only live with these extraordinary matters that threaten the next few generations in a profound way, and our own lives as well, by dwelling a lot of the time in a very carefully unconscious state. So, <clears throat> this is what I talked about with him, but we ended up talking deeply into Zen, and at the end of it, I said, so, Roshi, you call your teacher Roshi, and he's a Zen Roshi. Roshi, do you think I should take up Zen in a serious way? And he said, you already have. <laughs> so I did take it on from there. I took it on very seriously. And so that began to fill um, my, my life, which was already full children and single parenthood and uh, a busy academic career and so on. But it became, you know, the sort of song running through my life very strongly. And what attracted me to Zen is profoundly, is very much the fact that, although this is a very difficult kind of practice to convey, um, <clears throat> and it is a tradition that is really only understood and learned by soul version. It is great. It's not walking through that very fine misting rain and gradually, gradually, gradually finding yourself wet through. But it takes that long walk. And <clears throat> Zen, by its very nature, refuses um, explanation. Because why? It's not trying to be annoying, although I know David finds it very annoying at times. <laughs> but it is because, by its very nature, it um, is. It undoes all the usual ways we have of making up the world and making up ourselves. That's what it is about. It's about, in a way, restoring, <coughs> restoring the kind of awareness you have when a lot of that has fallen away or been, in a sense, almost slipped off your shoulders. The weight of it is pretty great when you begin to notice it. The other thing about Zen that's often said is that, you know, can't be, you can't be given Zen understanding. You have to experience it for yourself. Just like if I was to say, you know, I'm going to explain the taste of this water. How would I begin to do that? It would take a lifetime, and I still not have touched the nature of what it is to sip water. But when you sip it for yourself, you know it for yourself immediately. You know the taste of water. And that's very much the same with Zen. You in a way have to make yourself available to experience and know it for yourself. But when I say self or yourself, this is this self is not the same as the limited self of me, my self and I, that sort of little sealed unit you travel around with in the world. Zen is very much about opening us back up into a sense of no self. 
which list off some scary, let me assure you it is the most natural and dignity home state in the world. To, <coughs> I'll draw on the words of one of the great um, Japanese masters of the tradition, Dogen, Dogen Senji, 12th century genius, um, 13th century genius, 1200 to 1251 to um, <clears throat> said these words, he said, to study the way, and we talk about Zen as the way, it's a way of walking, it's a path, it's a path you walk and deeply learn as you walk. Um, to study the way is to study the self. But then he goes on in the next sentence, he says, to study the self is to forget the self. Now this doesn't mean becoming self forgetful and blundering about. It means that the study of the self itself gradually undoes this sense of self and opens it up into something much wider, more edgeless. It's like a small sense of self drops away into something that has no edges and it has no beginning, it has no end, it has no inside or outside. And so that's what he means when he says forgetting the self. And it's a strangely intimate state. It's sometimes called not knowing as well, or unknowing, not knowing. Um, we, whatever it is we think we know, is a very tiny bundle of stuff. And what lies beyond it is edgeless and vast. And it's a little like allowing the familiar um, ways that we use the mind to gradually, in the state of meditation, to gradually sort of naturally soften and melt away. And what's left is this deeply intimate state, intimate with whatever is happening, the air on your face, the, the, the blood flowing through your body, but more deeply than that, that sense of self I described, which is no longer a confined kind of sense of self. It's like dropping or abandoning that sealed sense of self by a thousand tiny subtle degrees of meanness into a kind of deep state of the focused awareness we call zazen. Zazen means seated awareness. <clears throat> but seated actually is not just sitting in meditation, it means the mind itself not moving towards or moving Really directly meeting what is, just as it is. And that's, whether that's alarming or gratifying or whatever else it is, no moving towards, no moving back from. So a kind of, a, a more still and settled kind of way of holding awareness. So this is not about um, explaining the universe or explaining or tracking and, and and um, finding a solid basis of beliefs about the universe. Not knowing is very much the practice of all contemplatives in all traditions, including, of course, the Christian tradition. And I have often spoken on alongside or, and to nuns and in Christian nuns in contemplative traditions, starting with um, the Jabiru, the, the nuns up in the um, Benedictine Abbey, uh, known to me, and they, they read my books to my astonishment. And so we have a lot of commonality. Um, that sense of dropping the self away is very much what a profoundly open state of prayer is like. It's not demanding something for the self, it's becoming willing. And so, from that point of view, something else that Robert Edmund said, that I appreciate great. He once said, we are not here to clear the mystery up, to bundle it up, explain it, make it explicable. He says, we are here to make the mystery clear, to make it clear to us that this is a profoundly mysterious business, being here at all. So, in short, I suppose you could say that Zen is awareness, it was a practice of awareness and paying attention. It is practice of, and it's in the practice, not a body of belief, a practice of 
focusing consciousness, heightened by strong intent to pay attention. And actually, it drops you into the most natural state of mind, in a way it removes an overlay that you're not even aware of till you study itself, and then the soul reveals itself more deeply. There's also um, a very important point that this is a deeply embodied mind. You're not casting away your body, you're not despising or disparaging your body, or anything that comes with it, including mortality. Not at all. It is allowing that to be completely accepted, deeply and profoundly accepted, that the fear around that drops away. Drops away. And this, it's also worth mentioning that um, Zen belongs to, there's two sort of, there's a big sort of revolution that happened in Buddhism around the time, around the, the time of the first century BC and the first century AD. <clears throat> Very much in the time of, around the time of Christianity coming into the world. And possibly these two facts are not unrelated. But we're talking here <coughs> about the Mahayana term. So, from Mahayana, that means great vehicle, Maha, great yana, vehicle or vessel. The teaching exploded into a much more inclusive form. The Hinayana, now, Theravada Buddhists don't refer to the Hinayana because it means lesser vehicle. It's very much from the point of view of the Mahayana that the earlier stage of Buddhism was somewhat disparagingly called the lesser vehicle. And why is it lesser? Because it is about my enlightenment. You know, if I got the rest of you, my enlightenment. I'm characterizing it, or in fact, I'm caricaturing it, you might say that, in a rather rough way. But I did appreciate a great sign that used to be in the Buddhist library where I taught for many years, taught Buddhist library and meditation hall in Sydney. Um, they had a sign up on, <coughs> on one of the pillars in the space that said, lesser vehicles will be towed away. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's an Mahayana joke. But really, the Mahayana, how can I give you a sense of this? It's um, maybe the image of the net of Indra will help. This is a beautiful, uh, mind-expanding image of the interconnectedness of all things. And what it says is, imagine that everything that is here, imagine reality itself as this vast net of endlessly intersecting threads. And at the, every intersection point in the vast net of Indra, there is a jewel. And each of these jewels is a being. But each of these jewels has many facets cut, cut into it. Every single facet reflects every other jewel in the net. So there's no part of us that does not reflect the whole of what makes us possible. And <clears throat> so that net of Indra image is a way, it's very much a Mahayana image, and it's about the vast connectedness of reality. And so that's where you might be able to understand that this is not about my personal salvation anymore. It is about the awakening of all of us together. You can't wake up without everything waking up with you. But the other part of the Mahayana that I appreciate greatly, and I can watch the time, um, is the sense of, well, everybody, I suppose, will have heard the basic truths of suffering that Buddhism is said to be about. So the four noble truths, if you haven't heard about them, they run like this. The first truth is <clears throat> the truth of suffering. Now it's not that there is simply that there is suffering, but that there is a truth of suffering, a discoverable truth. And one of the obvious first truths is that there's some suffering that cannot be avoided. Or there is sickness, death, cannot be avoided. But there is a vast body of other suffering that is effectively avoidable somewhat chosen, even if unconsciously chosen. So, 
The first truth of suffering is that there is suffering, that all sentient beings experience suffering and some of that is avoidable suffering. The second one is that there is a cause of suffering, a discoverable cause of how we, um, in a sense, pile or deepen our own suffering. And <clears throat> the third one is that there is um, a path to this, to, the, to no suffering. Now, no suffering is not like saying a complete end of all suffering, but certainly an end of avoidable suffering. A lifting up of the ways in which we make ourselves up as victims of suffering. Anyway, it would take a lot of telling to go deep. And finally, the fourth noble truth is that there is a path. There's a path to this end of suffering. And it sets it out as, as a whole series of right, right ways to hold yourself and, and proceed. However, um, the very fact of being deeply aware of and concerned with and involved with suffering is, a, I guess, a beautiful hallmark of the Mahayana turn in Buddhist um, philosophy and evolution. Um, and I'd like to read, I quote this in the minding here, but this is a quote from that book. And I'll just give you this to give you a bit of a sense of this. <coughs> Gary Snyder, who in fact is a well-known American poet and Zen um, character. Um, Gary Snyder evokes this generous courage of, and he says it like this, I don't mean the generous courage of saying it's not about my salvation. It's my salvation is going to lie in the salvation of the waking up of all beings that I can encounter. So, <clears throat> he says this, the Bodhisattva what a sattva means um, bodhi. Bodhi means awake, and sattva means one walking that path, the path of awakeness. The bodhisattva must live by the sufferer's standard to be effective in giving aid to those who suffer. Now, <clears throat> I think that's quite beautiful, and I don't want to talk about it. A bodhisattva is one committed to helping all beings become at ease in their own self-nature, which means freed from all avoidable suffering. When you know who you are, and that, and that means this deep forgetting of self that we call no self. When you know who you really are, then you can help others. Enlightenment is helping others in need and into enlightenment, or let's call it liberation, freedom. By helping others, we help ourselves to deepen enlightenment. We are all in this together. That is the great benefit. So it is interesting to me that um, Christianity and Mahayana turn, the turn in Buddhism arose in that same few centuries, but there were, of course, trade routes between those two worlds and a flow of ideas and a flow of perceptions that were shifting, shifting perceptions. Um, I thought I would um, just show you <coughs> the, I guess you'd call it religious regalia <laughs> that <coughs> comes with being a roshi. And I don't only wear these on formal occasions, but these are, this is called a rakasu, and it's, it's given to me at one of my two transmission ceremonies. This is a gold thread in it and it has, you can't see it clearly, but this is patchwork. All of this here is patchwork. It was the first robes of the, of the um, followers of the Buddha were made from scraps down at the dump. He said, go down, collect some scraps from me down at the dump. Make your robes from patchwork. Yeah, there's recyclers. And this is considered to be a kind of um, um, almost like an ox cube represents the rocks. This represents the entire robe of the Buddha in smaller form. 
partly because there were times of persecution of Buddhism right through the different ages, where in fact you lose your life if you're wearing the robe of the Buddha. So <coughs> you can wear the robe of the Buddha inside your own clothing. And it also has details on the back which include a, a teaching name and so on, which aren't flashed openly, they are not against your heart. You don't necessarily make a solid dance about any of this. There's also on the back in green embroidery, there's something that resembles a mountain and also a broken pine needle, or in the Australian context, casarina needle, let's say. It's saying that Zen is a mountain path. You walk, it's, it's, not, it's not meant to be sort of comfortable and easy. You walk, in a sense, deeper and deeper into the mountains. It's a climb. But also, as you walk, a pine needle might break. It changes your life. That is, to walk the path, has consequences, like pine needles <coughs> break as you brush past them. It's karmic, perhaps. So this is worn <coughs> like this, and you'll notice it's sort of too big for me. <laughs> and this is because it's only recently, <coughs> in the last couple of generations, that women have been considered enlightened enough to become Buddhists, to become enlightened, to become Roshis. So this is really made for the man, but I have to make it for most of them wear it. And I would point out that um, the most recent book I've written by Fred Zen <coughs> is very, <coughs> very much, by the way, the subtitle is Humanly Entangled in Emptiness. And it's very much about the embodied nature of practice and the fact that um, <coughs> the Buddhists are like Christianity, um, and Judaism, and Hinduism, um, maybe less so with Hinduism, it's more complex, but the great traditions have been extremely hard on women. They have not admitted women to full humanity. And this is certainly true of Buddhism, <coughs> where it is still held in some Asian countries that if you are ever to become you'll have to wait to be reborn in a male body. So this repudiation of the body very quickly becomes she at home to women, to after all, bring bodies into the world. And <coughs> this book is very much my own declaration of, I've had enough of all that. <laughs> I'm not tolerating that anymore. And it is, um, the red thread is, among other things, it is the, this thread of vast interconnectedness between all life. It's also body to body to body. You know, we're connected by the umbilicus, body to body to body. And so all of that has been an important part of my, I suppose, journey over the three decades, three and a half decades, <coughs> including from 2001 as a teacher to. I think, I suppose, to undo, to help undo um, any kind of ridiculous notion that, uh, that a woman, a female, a girl, is not entirely equal in her being. And actually, <clears throat> in the light of that, um, the second rakasu I was given at my transmission ceremony in America from my teacher in America, who is an Australian. Um, it was actually illustrated by one of the finest um, artists in the Zen world, Marini Oda, who's famous. She made this rakasu for me and she <coughs> illustrated it in her inventory with a bare breasted Buddha. So, this is a way of <coughs> making it very clear what I've just been mentioning to you. So, this is my alternative rakasu. And by the way, when I first heard the word rakasu, uh, I heard a story about it from someone who had been wondering about it, a, a Zen retreat, a seven day Zen retreat. They lost their rakasu, they misplaced their rakasu that they wear when they practice. And he would go around saying, Where's my rakasu? Has anyone seen my rakasu? And someone else heard him saying, Rocket suit. 